Hello, one and all, and welcome to today's... Oh my goodness, I sound like that guy from uh, the tile advert. Hi, name, my name's Frank, and I'm from Frank Tiles. And if you're not in Australia, that makes no sense to you whatsoever. But, hold on a moment, this title looks very familiar. No, it's not a repeat of the last lesson, it's a slight difference. All they've done now is, in the question, they have added a plus or minus b and a plus or minus b onto the end. What on earth could they be thinking of now adding more pluses and minuses? Nothing really. They're just now carrying on with vertical translations. Life is so much ex more exciting than it has been. Remember, previous video, we've looked at the idea of amplitude and period, and we need to know that for each of the dilations, reflections, and translations, what changes? Well, a dilation will absolutely affect the amplitude if it's dilated away from the x-axis, and a period if it's dilated away from the y-axis. Reflections do not change the amplitude or the period, and neither do translations. They change the look of the graph, but they don't change the amplitude or period. So as I've said in the previous lesson, a good function to sketch would be in this form. We are always looking for the coefficient of x to be 1, not just in sine or cosine transformations, but rectangular hyperbola, trunk eye, square roof graphs, circles, always looking for a coefficient of x to be 1, and positive 1, because that makes our life so, so much easier. Then you can deconstruct what all of these transformations are. But as I say here, the first value is a dilation from the x-axis. The second value, this 3, is a dilation from the y-axis, and that is a horizontal translation. In an exam, it's never going to give it to you in the nicest form. I can guarantee you it'll try and trick you. And because math is a trick, it shows the difference between understanding and regurgitation. Whenever you have the coefficient inside the bracket, just move it out. Factorize it out. So I would rewrite that as y equals 4 sine. Take the 3 outside the brackets, becomes x plus, And then you have to divide the pi on 2 by 3 to give you pi on 6. Now, looking at this, life is so much easier because I can see that my amplitude will change by 4. My period will change by a third. And I know that this will now actually translate that way by pi on 6. You can imagine the number of people who will translate it by pi on 2 and get the wrong answer completely. And it's just a silly little trick that throws so many people. We're now going to add vertical translations into the mix, and as I once and always do, here we go. Remember that unless they tell you which order to do it in, you have to do it DRT. And this is Dr. T. Say hi, Dr. T. This here is Mr. T. He was a very scary dude in the A-team in the 1980s. Look at all that bling around his throat. I was surprised he could even move, to be perfectly honest with you, but... That's a throwback to my childhood, and you're probably not all that interested. So, Dr. T, dilations, reflections, and translations. Now, again, if you can identify what they are in the equation, then you can absolutely draw these by breaking it down one by one. So here's an example. Let's sketch this function. 3 sine 2, open bracket, t minus pi on 4 plus 2, and make it between pi on 4 and 5 pi on 4. So they've actually limited my domain, which is, which is fair enough, right? So, let's just see what I've written as a note. Whenever they give you a function like this, always ask yourself what the maximum and minimum values of y is going to be. Now, interestingly, so many people will look at this graph and say, oh, the maximum and minimum will be 3 and minus 3. Well, at some point in the graph, it absolutely was. Because if we were to draw the standard sine curve, and here is my standard sine curve, and I'll try and make it bigger because I'm forever running out of room. That's pi on 2. There is pi, there is 3 pi on 2, and there is 2 pi, and we know the maximum is 1 and minus 1. All right? So, there is my standard graph. Yes, my amplitude is about to change, because the question says, let's do a dilation of 3 from the x-axis. Right, so a dilation of 3 from the x-axis. Now, this is actually me saying to you that in an exam, I tend to do this every single time. There is no absence from when I will draw little sketches, breaking it down step by step by step to allow me to work out what the graph is. I, no one that I know can do these in their head. No one. Now, that's my amplitude change. But why can I now not say the maximum and minimum of my function will be 3 and minus 3? Well, it's coming up. But remember, this whole chapter 
is about that plus two, that number that's now been added onto the end of my sine or cosine function. I'm now going to dilate one half from the y-axis. So all that means is that my, uh, again, I can draw a reasonable sine curve. It's going to be three. It's going to be minus three. There is zero. But now a dilation of half from the y-axis means I'm going to multiply everything by half. Pi on four, pi on two, three pi on four, and two pi on four, pi on, no, pi. For some reason there, I thought I was dividing by 4 rather than 2. And see, I've just written a 2. What is going on? It is pi. So there's my dilation of a half from the y-axis. So I'm breaking this down step by step by step. Let's just go back to my equation. What have I done? I've now done the amplitude. I've done that too. What do I do now? Well, there's my dilations. There's no reflections. And so I must be on my translations. Translate parallel to the x-axis positive pi on 4. Well, positive pi on 4? Yeah, because it was minus pi on 4 in the function. So I'm going to move it that way now, plus pi on 4. So dragging it down. I have to make it look like I'm actually bringing it pi on 4. So my graph is going to do something like this. Wow, this is exciting. Right, so there is a 0. This value was at 0. It's going to be translated now to pi on 4. I'm going to add pi on 4 to each of these values. So pi on 4 plus pi on 4 is 2 pi on 4, which is 2 pi on 2. And then this value here becomes where it was pi on 2. I'm going to add on pi on 4, going to become 3 pi on 4. And this value here is going to become pi. And this value here is going to become 5 pi on 4. Hold on, that 5 pi on 4 sounded wildly familiar. Well, yes, because it was in my domain. So actually, because I only wanted it between pi on 4 and 5 pi on 4, I'm not actually going to draw that part of the graph. It's got to start here and with a colored in dot. So that was my pi on 4. And I'm going to do my colored in dot there because they've limited my domain. So there we go. I have now translated parallel to the x-axis, positive pi on 4 units. Have I done? No. Because remember that plus 2 on the end of the function now, the whole point of this chapter, means I've now got to translate it up. two places and being very very careful here now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a dotted line to just suggest that this is now at five and minus one why because I'm going to add two to each of these values my amplitude is now going to change again because I've been translated vertically so if there is my median line now I could draw this I'm going to have trouble rubbing it out later, but you guys need to make sure that you rub that out. This is just so that I can have some idea. There's pi on 4. There's pi on 2. There's 3 pi on 4. There is pi. And there is 5 pi on 4. And so we are going to go up, down, down. Ooh, no, 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 no. See what I did there? I already skipped that up down down and up now there and there are points i have to label all right so I absolutely have to label them so because we now know that the median would be at five take away three which would be two so we would now have that as five pi on four comma two and this one here would be at pi on four comma two any maximum and minimums generally have to be done but then we would have to find these x-axis intercepts. And how do you find the x-axis intercepts? Well, yes, you put the whole function equal to zero. Now, off the top of my head, can I remember what the function is? No, but if I wanted to find the x-axis intercepts, I would put into my calculator zero equals three sine two x minus pi on four plus two comma. Uh, no, no, because I can limit the domain, I can put Limit the domain, I want pi on 4 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 5 pi on 4. Do a comma, do an x, and put that all in a solve function. Now when I do that, wow, outward crop, outward pop my two crossing points, which you would then label on this graph. Okay, I don't have the time to do this, because uh, I wanted to make this a relatively short video. But that is the trick to all of these questions. Now, what about this type of stuff? Well, 
Sketch the graph of the following function between 0 and 2 pi and clearly indicate any x axis intercepts, right? Now, as I say here, it looks really familiar. When a function has either root 2 or root 3, I always know it's got something to do with the uh, triangles that we come up with. So, sketching this thing here would be my uh, vertical, tr uh, vertical dilation. Here would be my vertical translation. There's no change in anything, so a quick sketch would give me that as root 2. And you can have surds as amplitudes. In fact, I imagine they probably will do that. This is pi, and this is 2 pi, and then we would move the whole thing up by 1. So I'm just going to draw a dotted line here to help me actually frame this graph. There we go. So I now know that's 1. This would now be root 2 plus 1, and this would be... Uh, uh, 1 minus root 2 as my maximum and minimum values again this would still be at pi and this would still be at 2 pi but now I have these two values here to find how am I going to do that well if it's a non-calculated paper what do you know about the points there well y equals 0 so you would then be asked to do root 2 sine of x plus 1 equals 0 well rearrange this and you get root 2 sine of x is equal to minus 1 so sine of x is equal to minus 1 over root 2. And that looks wildly familiar. So if you remember from previous videos, find the first solution. Secondly, use all stations to Canberra to find subsequent solutions. And your job is done. All right, well, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully this is a repeat of what I've done over and over and over again. I seriously, seriously recommend you just breaking it down into individual transformations makes life so so much easier all right i look forward to seeing you next time thanks for your time for joining us for that video it was really good having you now if you'd like to know when the next video is coming why not click on subscribe alternatively head on over to mathsguru.com where you can watch all of the videos on its own dedicated website while otherwise watch the video that's just popped up it'll be part of this series all right take care see you again soon